today, Father, we might be renewed. Father, help us to see Jesus in his word. Father, pray, Lord, that, uh, that even in the words that I speak, Father, you might use them. And that, Father, we might uh, reflect Jesus better in the world in which we live. Father, uh, be at work amongst us by your word. Amen. I have a PowerPoint today, of which people are very happy, I expect. So Ephesians 6 verses 1 to 9 is where we're, we're at, and with the exception of parents, uh, often this little section sort of gets a bit glossed over. It's a little surprise because what comes before and what comes after are compelling, challenging, the relationship between wives and husbands before, and then we have the, the armour of God and this spiritual warfare thing that happens after these verses are sort of squeezed in between. Often overlooked, but they are important. But before we go on, we need to know something about uh, these relationship groups and the, uh, the set, the uniqueness uh, that appears in them. There's, a, there's something that makes these relationships and the way that Paul talks about them makes them distinctive in our world. Distinctive for Christians in our world. And that distinction points to the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And the umbrella which covers this distinction, distinctiveness is in verse 21. Submit yourselves to one another out of reverence to Christ. That's the driving force. We talked about that last week. We talked about it again this week. And it played out in two ways last week, didn't it? It played out in wives submitting to husbands. And while wives were expected to submit to husbands in the Roman world, and uh, sometimes the will of a husband would make a wife submit, Paul talks about it being a duty of following Jesus. And the second way this is illustrated was the command for husbands to love their wives. Meaning Jesus' day did not love their wives very often the way that Jesus loves the church. Meaning our day don't love their wives very often in the way that Jesus loved the church. Even in the great Christianisation period of the Western world, men did not love their wives very often the way that Jesus loved the church because when men talked, when people talked about this passage, all they talked about was how women were meant to submit. So we know the distinctiveness of husbands loving their wives. So this morning, as we speak about parents and children and and we speak of relationships within the workforce, we should expect to see something in Paul's writing here of the distinctiveness of submission to one another out of reverence for Christ. And that should mark all of our relationships. So, let's read the word. Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 9. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart just as you would obey Christ. 
obey them, not only to win their favour when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favouritism with him. Let's remind ourselves of why we're here in Ephesians 6. We could recount the journey, which is now seven sermons long, or you just talk about the why. There's a distance, I don't know about you, but you know, if we, we don't pay attention to our salvation, there's a distance that creeps in between what we say we believe and how we live. And it was great in, in our prayer time today, Mel, uh, Tess was talking about that, that what we, how we live was meant to reflect our confession of God's love for us. We don't intentionally grow that separation. It's not as if this is what we desire to happen, but it's there anyway. The writer of the Hebrews tells us that if we, uh, we need to pay close attention to our salvation, lest, lest we drift away. And sometimes after drifting along for a bit, when we stop and we look at what we believe, and then we look at our lives, we, we're surprised. There's a distance that has grown in the midst of that. But God loves us too much to leave us in that place, doesn't he? God loves us too much. So by his word, by his gospel, by his spirit, he draws us back to himself. We've prayed here for renewal and revival. We've immersed ourselves in the gospel. And we've begun to have a serious look about how we might live life in a manner worthy of the calling with which we have been called. And so we come to these relationships. And I know, I know when you're a parent or a child, when you're a worker, we don't have too many slaves nowadays. Some might think they are, but not real, not true. Sometimes, in this relationship, sometimes it's just a matter of survival. All you want to do is you don't want to have a major catastrophe happen. You're not interested, you're not thinking about, how might I submit to someone else out of reverence to the Lord? We're not even thinking about that. We just want to make it through the day. It happens to me. So how can we conform to Jesus in the midst of these relationships? How do we submit to one another out of reverence to Christ in these relationships? And I think our passage tells us what it looks like, at least in these relationships. It doesn't cover all of them, does it? Some of us here aren't parents. We were all children at one stage, but some of us, our parents have gone. Some of us are adults. Most of us here in this room are adults. Not all of us are working. Not all of us are employed. So, but it does set some principles for us. So firstly, children need to obey parents in the law. Secondly, fathers are not to exasperate their children, but bring them up in the law. Thirdly, slaves are to obey their masters like slaves of Christ. And finally, masters are to treat their slaves in service of Christ. I'm going to unpack those a little bit before coming to some conclusions, of, some conclusions about submitting to one another out of reverence to Christ and what that means in our world. All right? We're good. If you're note takers, there is a piece of paper in the newsletter which you can take notes on. Be good. They're really easy because I've helped you because I say one. Makes it easy, doesn't it? One. Children obey your parents. It's a family favourite, isn't it? Hey? 
To your parent, this is a family favour. Children, obey your parents. Honour your father and your mother. I don't know about you, but I'm often amused by the promise that is attached to this commandment. So that it may go well with you and you may enjoy a long life on the earth. I've heard some mothers say by way of instruction to their children, I brought you into the world and I can take you out of the world just as easily. As if, as if it was easy bringing them into the world in the first place. As most of us are aware, children are not born as blank slates, ready to be programmed with the right information to tackle life without fear, full of hope, and with grand expectations. Kids are not born into the world like that. I think that's a, uh, something that may have emerged in our Western world. I'm not sure if I was born in Ethiopia, I would have that same thought. Or if I was born in the lower caste of India, I'm not sure I would have that thought that I have a marvellous future waiting for me. I can be whatever I want to be, so long as I try hard enough or work hard enough. It's not really what children are like. It's not really what they're born with. They need training and they need discipline. And there's a relationship between children obeying their parents, how their parents train and discipline them, and being in the Lord. While obedient children who make their parents proud is not the sole domain of Christian parents, only children who follow Jesus can submit to their parents out of reverence to Christ. In fact, those children who follow Jesus are able to honour their parents even if their parents are not in Christ or do not care so much for their child's discipline or training. Yet those children who are far away from the Lord but who have Christian parents are still under the command to honour their parents. Parents, though, that they know they know when obedience is out of reverence for Christ or whether obedience is out of desire for reward. The oldest son in that famous parable of the prodigal, whether we want to call it the prodigal son or we want to call it the prodigal father, it doesn't really matter, does it? We know the story, yeah? And we know the oldest son. The youngest son comes home, the oldest son is angry because... The, younger, the, the father's lavishing stuff on the younger son who spent all of his inheritance on wild women and song. And he says, you're doing this, but you never even gave me a young goat to celebrate with my friends. All of his obedience for his father was for reward that he might get. We know the difference. The father knew the difference. The father knew his heart. But for children who are in the Lord, then they have the resource of the Holy Spirit to aid them. He works on their behalf, even at a young age. Anyone who believes in Jesus receives the Spirit. Isn't that right? That's good theology, I think. There's not like an age cap on it. You have to be so old in order to receive the Spirit. I wonder if there's an upper age cap as well. You know, if you're this too old, you can't receive it. Makes sense at all, doesn't it? Even when they're young. The Holy Spirit's at work in their life. They love Jesus to have God's Spirit in them. And just as He works in us to to help us in our weakness, yeah? to intercede on our behalf. He does that in their life as well. Which is really lucky because I know my kids and if they didn't have God, they didn't have the Spirit, they would just be left with me. And the poor kids 
would not be would not have recovered, I'm sure. So uh, the fifth commandment is not out of place yet. Yeah? So children, obey your parents in the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, but bring them up in the Lord. If I said, what does exasperate mean? Lots of people say, I sort of know what it means, but I'm not sure I know what it means. I didn't sort of know what it means, so I looked it up. So I thought that was a good thing. And I found that to exasperate is to frustrate someone. To annoy someone so much that it drives them to rash actions. Oh, I forgot to sign off my phone. Who's ringing me? I don't care. Perhaps it's the Lord saying, I don't want you to talk about this. Or don't want you to say the next joke. Perhaps that was it. So, I found that... Uh, yeah, exasperation to, to annoy someone, to frustrate them, so that they are making bad choices and bad decisions. Fathers can do that by being inconsistent, by placing uh, unattainable expectations on their children. By treating them not as children, but treating them as adults. You know, reasoning with children who cannot reason. Expecting results you might expect from an adult. A lot of things. We know favouritism exasperates children, drives them to do rash things. A lack of appropriate affection drives them to do inappropriate things. We could add a whole lot of things to that list. We spent a little bit of time. And I can say that this advice to not exasperate your children is right for any parent. Every parent. Any father. Not just followers of Jesus. It's natural for any good parent to not want to exasperate their children. Because they don't want their children to make rash and stupid decisions. So they don't do it. Well, they try not to do it. It's fun, though. But we try not to do it. We know it's not a good thing. Every parent knows that's not a good thing. But on the other hand, it's not natural for any parent to bring their children up in the ways of the Lord. That is, in the training and instruction of the Lord Jesus. This is the unique property of Christian parents. It belongs to Christians. And here are four ways in which that might happen. There are a lot more. But I thought I'd run out after four. Just, we'd be here forever. So, firstly, gospel, gospel, gospel. Rather than making yourself the ruler of the universe, it's vital that your children see you in subjection to Jesus in and through the gospel. Your children need to see that. The security and the identity and the purpose that the gospel give you in Jesus alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, is both the security, identity and purpose you instruct out of, and it is the gospel model to your children. Being loved by God, adopted into his family by grace alone, in Christ alone, is the wellspring from which your love for your children springs. Didn't I turn it down? we love our children. And we know that. We don't love because we don't love God because that was our idea. We love God because he first loved us. And from that love we love others. And just like you don't need to obey God to stay in the household of God. So if 
live today, I disobey God, I'm not out of the household. It's not like some yo-yo or bungee cord. I'm in and out, in and depending on my behaviour. But that's so much how we live, and that's another sermon at another time. But we live like that a bit. We think we're in, we're out, we're in, we're out, we're in, we're out, depending on my performance. God's not like that at all. And we're not like that with our children either. It's the gospel which helps drive that. Our children have our unconditional love regardless of their performance. We're not going to throw them out of our family if they do the wrong thing. We're not going to throw them out of our family if they don't believe in Jesus. It's not going to be the end of the world for them. Because it's not the end of the world for us in Christ. Thirdly, secondly, relationship between, there's a relationship between the gospel of God and the law of God. And these things sort of build on from each other. Well, it's the gospel of God that brings us into the family of God and as children of God that justifies us before God. The law of God still tells us what it means to live as people of God in a way that pleases God. The law of God is still the law of God. still reveals his heart to us. And it's the Holy Spirit through the grace of God that enables us and empowers us to live lives that please God. We didn't come up with that idea either. When we try and do it without the Holy Spirit, we sort of often make a mess of it. So we're not saved by faith to then live bound to and according to the law to maintain that status. Rather we say by grace through faith and out of that grace and faith we live lives pleasing to God. So Paul writes earlier in this letter to the Ephesians in chapter 2 verses 8 to 10, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, or we are God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand or in advance for us to do. This relationship between faith and the law of God, or the good works that God has prepared beforehand for us to walk in, works that we could think of as love of God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength, love our neighbour as ourselves, we can think of those words in that pattern, need to be expressed by parents in their daily life. This is how they ought to live. Otherwise there's a gap between what we believe and what we live, isn't there? And we don't want that gap. Minimise the gap. Thirdly, Love for children must, both, must be both in word and in action. There must be both. Children need a vocal affirmation to cement the service actions toward them. And this is especially important that it comes from fathers. Fathers need to tell their children they love them. They must. If we don't, if we don't, we... We cut something out for our children. That's really, really important. We all heard the stories of, of men especially who have not heard from their fathers, didn't hear from their fathers, that they loved them. And we know they grow up with a deficiency in being able to share that love. They grow up with an imbalance. It's really important. Fathers, tell your children you love them. Affirm that love in word and in deed. Much easier for us to do it in deed. Yeah, we'll go and work. We'll provide for the family. Put a roof over their head. Fix the car. Mow the lawn. Do the... Whatever. Except don't do the dishes. But do all those things for our children. But we find it so hard to say, I love you. Yeah. Fathers, you need to do that. Otherwise they won't be secure in your love for them. God does it for us, doesn't he? God showed his love for us in Christ, yeah? 
crucified for us. The greatest demonstration of love for us ever. But then he pours out his spirit in our lives, which sheds abroad in our hearts love from God. He's affirming that and confirming that to us all the time by his spirit and in his word. He tells us he loves us over and over again. Fourthly, give them a model to follow rather than dictatorial oversight. If your children cannot see what you want them to do, they cannot follow you. If they cannot see it, they cannot follow it. If they do not see you reading the word and putting it into practice, they will not know how to do it. If they do not see you praying and worshipping God, they will not know how to do it. If they do not see you loving God and loving your neighbour, they will not know how to do it. They cannot follow you. Fathers, do not exasperate your children because your children are your first disciples. Your children are your first disciples. Not your last ones. Not ones you can give to someone else. God gave them to you to disciple them. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, but bring them up in the ways of the Lord. Thirdly, slaves, obey your masters. I believe you faster. Like slaves of Christ. Slavery in Ephesus could come in three ways. Firstly, a slave might happen by a human trafficking. And we have that nowadays in our world. Human trafficking. It's not a modern thing. It's been around for millennia. So, second way, someone might become a slave through being part of a conquered people. So they might just take them and make them slaves. And thirdly, a slave might become a slave because they were in debt and they sold themselves to someone to pay off their debt. When the debt was paid, they were free. And the people in this last category often had better things to do as slaves. They did better work. They were treated better often. And it's that last category where we might draw some parallels for us in employer-employee relationship. But Paul makes no distinction. Slaves are slaves are slaves are slaves for Paul. We should also note that when Paul is addressing here a slave or a master, he's addressing the Christian slave or the Christian master, but that doesn't mean the people they are uh, indebted to are Christians or the slaves of the master are Christians. Yeah? It's only the ones who are hearing the message are Christians. So, with respect to workers, it is good doing yourself Doing as you order in your work environment is not a particularly Christian thing to do. We would expect that from every worker, wouldn't we? Every teacher should teach well. Every shop assistant should assist well. Yeah? Everybody should do it well. Anyone who wants to succeed in their job will do that, won't they? Anyone who cares will do that. What's different with respect to a follower of Jesus is their motivation. Christians owe a debt of love to Jesus. He saved us, so we respond to Jesus from the heart. And this manifests itself in how we work out of reverence to Christ. We work as we should with respect and sincerity of heart, as if our employer were the Lord himself. And sometimes... That's not very easy. There will be sometimes, occasionally, there will be circumstances when the employer might be there untenable. And this is where the parallels end. You couldn't resign from being a slave. Yeah? I'm not doing this anymore. Spit the dummy and go home. Home was where you worked. <laughs> there was no distance at all. You couldn't do it. But, uh, but, you know, when there's risk of life or limb in our employ or this persistent abuse that threatens, then after seeking counsel from the Lord, after seeking wisdom from those around us, we should follow that wisdom, follow that counsel, and 
likely the Lord will make a way of escape for us. But if work is simply hard, or boring, or not to your liking, or, or what you might consider is beneath you, uh, the injunction, not only here but in other places of Scripture, would be to stay as if Jesus is your boss. Because ultimately, he is. This is the same as if we're treated unfairly, overlooked, maybe if we make fun of because we're Christians, we should stay. We don't work for our own sake, do we? We don't work to build our own kingdom, I hope. We work to build his kingdom. We're about him, his work. James says that, that we persevere under suffering and under difficulty so as to test and prove our faith. This testing is a purifying work for us so that we might become more like Jesus, that the Holy Spirit might have an opportunity to conform us to the image of his Son. And while the motivation for a person of the world is for immediate reward, career advancement, or whatever else they can get from obeying their employer, a young goat to sacrifice with their friends, perhaps this is not so for the follower of Jesus. They submit themselves to the employer because they know that this pleases God. They know this pleases God, therefore I will do it. And that God will reward each person for whatever good they do, whether slave or free. And this reward is ultimately in the end when we see Jesus face to face. For masters, treat your slaves in service of Christ. I think the connection can be anyone, for anyone who is in leadership or oversight, who employs someone, who supervises someone, managers, anyone. Paul says masters should treat their slaves in the same way. The same way refers to serving the Lord and not people. So treat them in the same way. Treat them as you would be serving the Lord. In addition, we might also see that overseers should manage people over whom they have authority in the knowledge that the Lord will repay or reward people for whatever they do. Both worker and manager are subject to the same Lord who rewards them according to his pleasure. Masters should not threaten those that oversee, but realise that Jesus is their master as well as yours. Who hold, hold both to account without favouritism. And that's, again, something that's a future thing. Well, sometimes things have a way of working themselves out in our days, our weeks, our years, so that people can reap what they sow. And we see that sometimes. Sometimes we see the opposite of that. We see bad people prospering. Yeah. We see people suffering. We can only really be assured of true justice when the righteous judge judges. Bring this to a conclusion, shall we? My phone's ringing again. Just to remind me. Ephesians 4.1 Live life in a manner worthy of the calling with which we have been called. Points to Ephesians 5.8 Be filled with the Spirit. Go on being filled with the Spirit. And then Ephesians 5.21 Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's a journey of connected points that tell us how we need to express our trust in Jesus through our following of him. Being subject to one another means to live out the roles that come with the stages of life, but are here described as husband and wife, child and parent, slave or master, in reverence to Christ Jesus. So wherever you're at, we live in, out of reverence to Christ. That's our motivator. Submit out of reverence to Christ. We live in these roles as long as we, well, we live out these roles as long as we're in the roles. We live them unto Christ 
with him as our Lord, neither ourselves, our wisdom, our families, our cultures, our traditions, our countries have that authority. Only Christ. Only Christ has that authority. Jesus commands our love in obedience. Jesus empowers our love in obedience. And these relationships, on the one hand, so ordinary, and in some cases so seemingly so small and insignificant in the scheme of things, become in the hands of the living God, who dwells by his spirit in followers of Jesus, Jesus transforming agents in a world that has gone very wrong. And we don't speak about the Roman world, the Roman Empire in which the Ephesians dwelt. We talk also about our Western Empire, where individualism and reason and materialism reign in the hearts and minds of people everywhere. The very thought of being subject to another is a curse in today's world, a sign of weakness and error and a loss of freedom that cannot be countenanced in today's world. To propose that we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, and to see that submission in the work of marriages, households, and workplaces, is to dethrone the idols of individualism and materialism, and to challenge the autonomy of reason as the sole factor of, of, of knowledge. We challenge it with faith in Christ and love of Christ. Some might think that the ideas presented in Ephesians 5.21 to 6.9 are out of step with our world, out of step with our culture. But the ideas presented here are actually revolutionary. And when they're implemented in the power of the Holy Spirit, by faith in the crucified and risen Lord Jesus, they can turn the whole world upside down. These ideals come from the very heart of God. This is what God is like. There is submission in the relationships in God, in Father, Son and Holy Spirit. They actually have a community together. They're quite happy together. You know, they didn't need us. God didn't create out of a need that he needed more people because he was lonely. He wasn't lonely. They had perfect community. And in perfect submission, they serve one another. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They create community. And when we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, we too create a community that looks like him. Acts 2. We have this picture of a beautiful community created in Acts 2. We say, well, it be like that. In Acts 2, we say, well, let's be like that. And that's a community that looks like Jesus in that time. I don't know what a community that looks like Jesus in our time looks like, because I can't point and say it looks like that. Submitting one to one another out of reverence to Christ is the stuff of renewed Christian lives. And while we look for revival in our city, we know that it's ultimately God's work and we can't make it happen. We can pray for it. But we can't push very hard in the lives of people. We can only push when we see God working. Otherwise we stuff it up. Yeah. We push too hard. We try too hard. But I think the real work that God wants for us and from us and to do in us and to us is to be renewed and revived in Jesus ourselves. What happens? What happens if Jesus brings people here to this church? What happens if the people Jesus brings here in our church are people who are full of sin and full of pain? What happens then? What will we do? What will we do when they ask us the hard questions of life? 
the things that people are saying about Christians and say they, they don't love. What are we going to do? What are we going to say? Will we love them like Jesus loved us? Or will we quote chapter and verse? Will we quote chapter and verse? Or will we love them? I don't read in the scriptures Jesus quoting chapter and verse. I don't read it when he talks to the one of the well. He's not quoting chapter and verse. Is he? I don't see it. I don't see Jesus doing that. But I don't see Jesus condoning sin either. But I see Jesus loving people. How much will we love Jesus? How much will we love people? How much will we submit to one another out of reverence to Christ? Because that's how we build the community. Let's pray. Father God, we, um, we know we're not all that we ought to be, all that we can be. Father God, we, we need you to do amazing works in our lives. And Father, we, uh, we're sorry, Father, when we point the finger outside and we say they're not right, they're not doing right. Want us to be like Jesus, and so Father, we want to, we want to come and, uh, and submit ourselves to you. Pray you do a work in us, renew and revive us, because we need reviving and we need renewing. You're bringing people back to your church, Father. You are bringing people to know you. you want to be a place, Father, where people will, will see you in our faces, in our relationships, in our love for one another. We ask in Jesus.